It's not as common knowledge than you might think that we are still in the Ice Age, but it clearly underlies our way of thinking about prehistoric worlds since, with the exception of woolly mammoths and saber-toothed cats, we often think of landscapes which are much hotter than today. And this much is true. So much so in fact that the climatic conditions at the time of the non-avian dinosaurs has been nicknamed the Mesozoic Greenhouse which makes it very easy to forget that you actually had polar dinosaurs that were adapted to very cold conditions. During the age of reptiles, average global temperatures fluctuated but were around 6 to 12 degrees Celsius warmer than they are today. Which may not sound like a huge amount, but remember that's an average with extremes outside of those numbers existing in certain parts of the world. As such, no ice caps were present on Earth, nor had they been since the late Permian 30 million years or so before that. Because of this, the amount of solid mass that you could walk on looked quite different, given that an actual land mass exists at the South Pole, but nothing is actually present that is central to the North Pole. During the first part of the Mesozoic, in the early Triassic, the North Pole probably had a little more land as Pangaea began breaking up, but it soon began spreading out as the Antarctic continent moved further south while still conjoined with Australasia and India. As the Arctic spread out around the perimeter of the North Pole, certain land masses built up the Antarctic, and in terms of both poles, this is where things stuck for a while, at least until the late Cretaceous. This is where the Indian and Australasian subcontinents split from Antarctica, meaning that any dinosaur found in Australia and India from the late Cretaceous onwards do not count as polar animals. In terms of what it was actually like to live at either pole, conditions wouldn't have changed a huge amount across the Mesozoic. But there was a temperature drop during the early Jurassic which was low enough for ice caps theoretically to form, though it's not confirmed whether or not they actually formed or not. Temperate forests reached as far as they could before hitting any ocean, with somewhat warm summers and winters where it likely snowed. Essentially, the polar climate at the time would have felt very homely to those that live in Europe or the more northern regions of the North American continent with annual mean temperatures being around 6.3 degrees Celsius, the warmer months hitting around 14 degrees Celsius, and the winter getting as low as minus 10 degrees Celsius. The only thing they wouldn't find so homely would be a feature that is still present to this day, and that's perpetual nighttime for half of the year and constant daylight for the other. This is actually the main reason things got so harsh during the winter rather than low temperatures, since plants did not have access to their main food source. So only the hardiest flora could survive here, such as ferns and horsetails. So as you can probably guess, less nutritious plants means that only the hardiest fauna could survive here year-round as well. Most of the animals you could find near the poles at the time likely migrated south during the winter, but there are some with adaptations that seem to imply they could handle the dark winter. So let's take a look at them. Now unfortunately we're going to have to skip over the Triassic because there aren't actually any dinosaur-bearing formations that we know of that would have pertained to either pole at the time. And as far as the Jurassic is concerned, we've only got one formation from the South Pole that shows any sort of dinosaurs. The Hansen Formation is in what is now Ross Dependency, a section of Antarctica claimed by New Zealand, and is from the early Jurassic. The biggest danger for dinosaurs here at the time were the regular volcanic eruptions rather than colder temperatures. But it still would have seen darker times of the year. Only two species have been named from here, those being Crylophosaurus and Glacialosaurus but many other indeterminate specimens have been exhumed, including sauropodomorphs, such as massospondylids and lessomsaurids, theropods such as coelophysidae, and another ornithischian of unknown affinity. Now it should be noted that Antarctica was still very much attached to Africa, South America and Australia at the time, making up Gondwana. So many other Jurassic dinosaurs from those continents likely would have ventured this far south at some point. Now if we really want to sink our teeth into true polar dinosaurs, we need to go to the Cretaceous. Sticking with the South Pole, we can not only count dinosaurs found from James Ross Island of Antarctica, such as Antarctopelta, Morosaurus, Antarcticavus, and Imperobator, but we can also include the very long list of Cretaceous Australian dinosaurs, since it was still attached to Antarctica for at least part of it. Of course, the southern part of Australia was at least low enough to be counted as polar once it did drift apart from the rest of Antarctica. So we can also include Mutaburosaurus, Minmi, Wiwarosaurus, Wintonotitan, Sabanosaurus, Australotitan, Lealinosaura, Australovenator, Raptor, and many, many others. 
Now again, these dinosaurs would have had the opportunity to migrate north during the colder, darker months. But some dinosaurs show adaptations that imply that they might have stayed. Leolinosaura was one such dinosaur, with Walking with Dinosaurs famously showcasing how these little guys got through the year. Leolinosaura had particularly large orbits for its size, which is a common trait seen in animals that are specialised for low light conditions. A handy trait when you're living in months of darkness. Then of course there are the theropods that would have potentially taken advantage of this food source, such as Australovenator, a Megaraptorid that would have been just about the right size to be able to get by on a Leolinosaura or two. Moving up to the North Pole though, we see a few more famous faces. Again, the Arctic, much like today, had no landmass of its own, instead with its terrestrial areas being around the perimeter poking through from the other northern hemisphere continents. One such formation that shows this can be found in the northern parts of Alaska, which would have fallen within the Arctic Circle at the time, and that is the Prince Creek Formation. At the time, this was the part of western Laramidia that poked into the Arctic Circle, but it does show quite a few dinosaurs that would have roamed around the more southern parts of Laramidia, some of which are found in the most famous formation, Hell Creek, which I'd talk more about here. Some hard hitters were found here, such as Alaska Cephal and Pachyrhinosaurus, a few other indeterminate Leptoceratopsids, Thescalosaurines and Lamiosaurines, and the famous and gigantic Edmontosaurus. Theropods here include Tyrannothelestes, the famous Dromaeosaurus, tracks from a Therizinosaurid, Troodon, and the Tyrannosaurid Nanuxaurus. Now much about the southern continent, this would have seen its fair share of nighttime for a few months of the year, so any dinosaur found here stands a good chance of being able to stand the harsh conditions of the area, but two questions remain. How many dinosaurs came here that we haven't found, and did they stay for the entirety of the year? Again, the size of these animals might give us a clue. The size of the herbivores seems to lean more towards the larger end, meaning that these guys can take in more calories and aren't as fussy but the carnivores seem to hit much more of a Goldilocks zone. The troodontid remains are much larger than most others found in the world, and the tyrannosaur remains are also pretty big, but not quite as big as many of its other relatives around the world at the time. Now, a herbivore would not need to be so specialised to munch down on flora year-round this far up, but a predator the size of T-Rex would need to be able to pick from a very wide array of animals to get its calories from, which we don't find here. In short, only certain herbivores were generalist enough to feed here year-round, which restricts the size and diversity of carnivores that can also feed here. So that amount of diversity certainly implies that these dinosaurs were capable of living in these areas year-round. In other words, the carnivores hit that sweet spot of being big enough to not be losing too much heat, but also small enough to not need as many calories as a high heat environment can bring. So we may be seeing carnivores that live here year-round, living on the herbivores that spread out when the season favours it, and getting by on the herbivores that can manage to stay here in the harsher months. Look, now I'm no hunter, nor do I endorse such an activity when there's not actually a need for it. But if you want to tell me what dinosaur you think would give you the best winter coat to explore the Arctic, let me know down below whilst I answer today's questions. The first of which comes from Laura Chapel 6795 Paleodixion, what do you think is doing that? The souls of Dinosaur Rebox. Okay, but seriously, uh, Paleodixion is a trace fossil that leaves this honeycomb-like structure on a sediment, and it's found all throughout the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic, with very similar structures being made to this day near hydrothermal vents, but it's not actually known what is making this. The leading theory is that it's some kind of burrow, but it also has been suggested that it's an imprint left by things like sea sponges or is actually a body fossil left by some sort of giant foraminifera. Now I have carried out my own ethnology project, but that was dinosaur footprints, so I'm not exactly a burrow expert. But I had seen many, many fossilised burrows in my time, and there are really not many, if any, that are this uniform. The hexagonal patterns left in this fossil are very precise, which doesn't discount a burrow altogether, depending on what the burrow was used for or how it was made, but I just find it fairly unlikely and would put it down more to the latter theories, that being a body fossil of some sort of organism. 
Again though, please take that with a grain of salt because there are other people out there with a lot more expertise on this than me that would definitely disagree. Uh, our next one comes from J-S4T3I uh, who has asked, uh, maybe on how we figured out or think dinos were warm-blooded and lived in all climates. Fitting. Um, ooh. Okay, so the answer to that is a very, very long story after nearly a century and a half or so of research. But I'm going to try to summarize. The first thing to bear in mind, though, is that thermoregulation is made up of a lot more than just warm-blooded or cold-blooded. It's actually a bit more of a sliding scale, and animals have come up with a plethora of different ways of achieving homeothermy, um, which is basically being able to maintain an internal body temperature regardless of what the outside influence is. I mean, unless the outside influence causes death. First up, we know that they lived in variable climates simply because we found them there. And plenty of traces left in the rock record can give us an idea about what kind of environment was around at the time, such as what types of plants were around, and isotope analyses telling us how hot or cold the area was. Then we've been able to find certain signs in the morphology of dinosaurs. Warm-blooded or endothermic animals live much more active lifestyles, and things like limb morphology in dinosaurs show that they had bodies capable of such lifestyles. Bone histology has also been handy in surmising the thermoregulation of dinosaurs as well, with microscopic growth patterns of many dinosaurs lining up more closely with endothermic animals such as birds rather than other reptiles. Speaking of birds, we know that many dinosaurs have feathers, which are excellent heat insulators. And you don't need to stop heat from leaving your body if it isn't really producing any. Then in the case of many dinosaurs, well, arguably most dinosaurs, Simple maths can tell us that their form of thermoregulation was something known as inertial homeothermy, more commonly called gigantothermy. This is where an animal's sheer size means that heat takes a lot longer to disperse from the body, so any heat gained or produced by bodily functions at that magnitude will stay around almost indefinitely. And, spoiler alert, dinosaurs got pretty big. Again though, thermoregulation in fauna is very much a sliding scale, so there may have been plenty of dinosaurs, especially in hotter climates, whose internal body temperatures varied much more, perhaps relying more on their environment for heat in order to conserve energy. Anyway, as always, I really appreciate you submitting those questions as much as I appreciate everyone else for watching this far into the video. Please consider subscribing if you haven't already, so that I can catch you guys next time.